is your mind feeding right now? Where is it hoping to get its happiness? This is a very basic question in meditation. The whole issue of feeding, taking sustenance, it's a, a major issue in the Buddhist teachings. There's a series of questions. They're called the, the novices' questions. They start out with what's one, what's two, what's three, what's four, all the way up to ten. And like four is the Four Noble Truths, and five is the Five Aggregates, and so on up through ten. The most interesting question, though, is what's one? Now, some teachers might answer, well, there's the oneness of the world, there's the oneness of the underlying principle of all things. But the Buddha's answer was something totally different. What's one is all animals, all living beings depend on food. If we talk about the oneness of the world, the interrelatedness of the world, it's through the process of eating. Because how do we relate to each other on the most basic level? Well, we eat each other. On all different kinds of levels. Not only just physical food, but there's emotional food, mental food. And that's enough to make your heart sick. We're often told that the interrelatedness of being is something to be celebrated. It's a good thing. The purpose of the meditation is to get in touch with that sense of interrelatedness. But you look how the Buddha taught about interrelatedness, and you see he took a totally different tack. There's a point where he reminds the monks that it's hard to find someone who has never been your mother, who's never been your father, brother, sister, son, daughter. Why is that? Because the process of transmigration has been going on for such a long, long time that everybody you meet has been related to you in some way. Now, instead of looking at that as something to celebrate, he says it's enough to make you want to get out, because all relationships end in loss. And from the sorrow that comes from that loss, he says the amount of tears that we've shed in that long, long time is more than the water in the oceans. And then there's that passage where he talks about the he talks to the monks about the various types of food there are. There's physical food, there's the food of contact, the food of volitions, and the food of consciousness. This is how do you how are you supposed to regard these things? In each case, it's not something very positive. The fact that you're born with this body that constantly needs to have food stuffed down the throat, or else it's going to die. And before it dies, it's going to suffer all kinds of hunger pangs. I mean, that's a major weight on the mind. As soon as we're born, we cry. We're hungry. And a lot of life is devoted to just that one process of finding something to eat, keep this body going. And look at what we eat, though. It's, even if you're vegetarian, there's a lot of suffering that goes into creating food, getting food ready for it to stick in your mouth. And the Buddha says, whenever you eat, you should think about the story of the husband and wife with their one baby son and going across the desert, and they don't take enough provisions to go with them. And halfway across the desert, they run out of provisions. What are they going to do? So they decide, well, rather than having all three of them die, they kill the baby son and they make dried meat and jerky out of him, and then feed on that and get across the desert. So at least two of them survive, rather than all three of them dying. It's a pretty horrendous story. But the Buddha says you should have that attitude towards your food when you eat it. This is your son. This is your child. And so you eat the food just for the sake of survival, because that's what's required. And not for intoxication, and not for playfulness, and not to put on bulk or to make yourself beautiful, but just to keep the body going. As for the food of contact, that's sensory contact, it says you should think about a cow that's been flayed, and wherever it goes, if it leans on a wall, all the little insects and other beings in the wall will feed on the cow, they eat away at the cow. 
that leans against the tree, all the insects in the tree will eat against the cow. Wherever there's contact, there's, you're being eaten away. I'm afraid I forgot the analogy for the food of volition, but the food of consciousness, he says, is like a criminal that's being speared with spears, 300 spears in the morning, 100 spears in the morning, 100 spears at noon, and 100 spears in the evening. Constantly being attacked. And these are the things the mind feeds on. This is where it looks for sustenance. And the process of taking sustenance, that's suffering in its, as well. The word for sustenance, upadana, also means clinging. Wherever the mind clings, that's where it's feeding. And the process of clinging, the Buddha said, is suffering. The process of having to depend on other things like this, that's suffering. And a relatedness is no fun, because the system that we're dependent on is just so much out of our power. And we're lucky if it works for our happiness for a little while, but it always keeps changing, because we can't control it. And there's so many factors working together, it's a chaotic system. So what's the way out? Well, if you try to deny interconnectedness, you starve to death, physically. Or mentally, you start suffering as well. So the issue is learn to learn how to feed more skillfully. Provide better food for the mind. This is what we do when we meditate. Try to find a source of happiness that doesn't have to depend on other things. The mind can be reliant on itself. That's the idea. We start by depending on the breath. Feed on the breath. Learn how to savor the breath. Give the mind something better to feed on. If your happiness depends on things outside. It's causing trouble for other people, trouble for yourself. Well, find a better happiness. That's the basic principle of the meditation. If you learn how to savor the breath, you realize there's a lot to, to feed on right here, just the sensation of the breath coming in and going out. And as you get more and more skilled staying here, learning how to work with the breath, finding what the breath can do for the body, you begin to realize that a lot of the things you used to depend on emotionally outside, you don't have to depend on anymore. It's like the breath is health food for the mind. We've been eating junk food for who knows how long. And no wonder the mind is thin and famished and in a bad mood. But now you start feeding it health food and the mind starts getting stronger, more self-reliant. Ultimately, you get to the point where you don't have to feed anymore. That's when it's really good. The hunger is no longer there. Because the mind has been well nourished on good food. And it's gotten so skillful in its feeding that it finally realizes it can get along without feeding at all. So always keep this issue in mind. Where is your mind feeding right now? What is it eating? Where is it taking its sustenance? Try to think of it as taking a snapshot of your mind. Is it sneaking something out of the refrigerator and knows that it shouldn't be eating? Or is it making sure that it eats nothing but good, healthy food? Because that's what's going to make all the difference in the world. 